Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Uh, Danielle was a great friend, and I'm happy to dedicate this to her and her memory. Also, I want to just take a moment of pause and recognition of the humanity that we need to have in the world right now. And uh, I know that it's a difficult time for many of you have come out in relationship to all the different wars that are happening, and I just want to acknowledge that, and that I thank you for being here with me tonight. So in 1970, I made this very first self-portrait in getting my uh, camera for my ninth birthday, which I asked for because I decided to tell my parents that at the age of uh, nine, I was going to be a social documentary photographer and that I was in love with Lewis Hine. And, uh, and so uh, they, they gave me my camera and the first uh, frames of the camera were uh, very much what I have spent my life kind of pursuing oddly, that it would be of community, of family, of the landscape. And uh, those are the areas that I've traversed in all these different ways of different iconography. But the more important thing is just the idea of how specific my identity was even at nine and that we forget that a little baby dyke can have like a bad haircut from their mom and uh, forget to zip their flowered pants. <laughs> so after graduating from CalArts, it was very interesting, my time at school. And I, what, what this lecture is going to be based on is I'm going to go through kind of the various, various bodies of work very quickly. And then I'm going to focus on the last seven years of how I've been using the medium of photography in relationship to four bodies of work that I've made in the last seven years. But my assistant said that I can't do a lecture without the greatest hits. So you're going to get a little bit of the greatest hits in the beginning and the explanation in relationship to why I make my work. And, uh, and these were made in 1989. I was uh, in, in LA. I had graduated from CalArts where my thesis was on master plan communities where my teachers like Catherine Lord would say to me, well, you're a dyke. Why aren't you making queer work? And I would say, actually, critiquing master plan communities is queer work. Because if we don't make all the work in relationship to ideas of identity, then what are we doing? And so I've proceeded through my life making those vast kind of bodies of work. But these were all my friends with fake mustaches. I'm in there as Bo. Uh, we used to ride our motorcycles to, uh, to the Palms, the only seven day a week lesbian bar in LA. And we tried to get girls to go home with us on the back of our motorcycles. And, I was, I was always unsuccessful, and I think it's because my persona was a used aluminum, a used aluminum side salesman from Ohio. <laughs> so for about four years, I went back and forth. Uh, I was working as, I designed the, the photo lab at UC Irvine, and I worked there five days a week as a lab tech. And so in the summers, I would take a month off and I would go back and forth from San Francisco to my home studio in Silver Lake and make portraits. And so this is a series of portraits that was really trying to honor my community. I was trying to change the relationship to documentary photography in my own mind. I was leaning heavy into the history of painting and specifically Holbein. I, I felt that by photographing my friends in their homes that it would have this continuation of a voice that I wanted to have the architecture of identity in my queer community at this time to be on the body. So this is Justin Bond. This is Miguel who died shortly after this portrait of AIDS. Um, a lot of the portraits also became uh, images that were given out at memorial services as I, lo as I lost so many friends in, the, in, in my community. This is Joe and Idexa. Um, a lot of these are pages from the Fiden book because one of the things that the Fiden book did that came out about two or three years ago now was it created these categories of, um, of people, uh, places, and politics. And throughout it, all the various bodies of work were woven in. And I had never really thought about the bodies of work in that way. They had always been very distinct exhibitions. But weaving all of this in really created a, a new way for me to begin to, to think about and look at the work. Uh, Self-portrait cutting was made in, in now 30 years ago. So this is why the Leslie Lohman Museum honored me was it's up there right now. 
and it was a 30th anniversary that the curator, uh, Gemma uh, Rolls Bentley, created a show around this, around home. And this was after a breakup, and I basically for a year kept doodling this. You remember when we had phones where they had cords and you couldn't like move around, so you sat and actually doodled at your desk? So this was like a constant doodle that would come out, and then I decided to have the artist Judy Bamber uh, do the cutting on my back. Um, and uh, one of the things that is happening, if you get to LA between January 11th and before or during freeze art fair at the end of February, I'll be showing for the first time a 30th anniversary show at Regan Projects, which is the queer body in relationship to LA as a city. And I have the documentation of self-portrait cutting on my back being made as a domestic video. So that'll be shown for the first time in that exhibition. So it's not going to be quiet anymore. All of a sudden, you're going to see my living room. So this is Eleanor and Megan from Minneapolis from a body of work of, of domestic, where I bought an RV and I traveled around the country for uh, three and a half months during uh, around 1997, 98. And then this is from um, the portfolio inauguration. So this idea of windows and visibility and the kind of what we see and how things are contained in the relationship of identity and all of that becomes apparent within the structure of, of, of the work. So this is also uh, from San Francisco from domestic. This is Flipper, Tanya, Chloe, and Harriet. And then this is Miggy and Eileen in um, Los Angeles. She is very pregnant. She had twin girls uh, two days after this image. And then we have self-portrait nursing, which was made in 2003. Um, and my son is just a little over a year old here. And I wanted to make a, a piece that was very Madonna and child, but also in relationship to my butch identity. And when I became pregnant, you know, in, the, in, in, in uh, 2001, before having Oliver, a lot of my friends were really surprised that I would get pregnant because they didn't know that butches would want to get pregnant. And so it was a big kind of thing in my community about my own pregnancy in relationship to my butch identity. And, uh, but it was always really important to me to have a child, and I was so fortunate that at 40 I could. Uh, this is Oliver in a tutu in 2004. His favorite thing to do was laundry, and so it was just, he was constantly shoving things in that washing machine in the, uh, in the kitchen, and, uh, and uh, he really loved his uh, pink tutu and his tiara, and he, he still does at 21. This is from a body of work uh, called 1999, in which I went on a road trip. The, the Oliver and a Tutu comes from a body of work titled In and Around Home. And there's a book that I made called 1999 and In and Around Home. And a lot of it is the relationship of politics and fear within America. And so in 1999, it was this quaint fear of Y2K. We thought we were going to lose all of our information. And then by the time I made In and Around Home, I had moved back to California and 9-11 had happened. And so it was the relationship of a Bush administration and the isolation of one in their neighborhood where we don't go on American road trips anymore and what is our relationship to ideas. And we certainly experienced that recently through the pandemic as well in even a more way. Then this is a Festa del Rendatori, which happens in Venice, Italy. And this is from 2009 from a body of work I made in Venice. And it's to celebrate the end of the plague and it happens the same time every year. So in this image, you see this really kind of incredible landscape. And as a photographer, I like to argue with National Geographic. I think it's really a fun little fight to have. You know, it's like, oh yeah, National Geographic, you and your nature photographers and your zoom lenses. So instead, I made a vast landscape where the print is really large, but in this area of the large print is a grizzly bear with her cubs surrounded by a pack of wolves. And I kind of love that idea of the vast landscape of how nature really exists versus like what happens with the up cl close world of National Geographic. So I like to tussle with that a bit. And then on the other page is a body of work from high school football 
where I traveled the country for three years and, uh, and documented the, the uh, high school football field as a landscape, as an extension of American landscape. So much of my work has to deal with what is iconic, how we begin to think about the construct of an image, the relationship of the cliche of, of images. Also in sports, it's always the zoom lens. It's the relationship to the action of the field versus the landscape of the field. And so by traveling from Alaska to Hawaii to Texas, all throughout all of the states and creating these high school football fields, it was a way to talk about America at war of Iraq and Afghanistan, of a way that these young bodies are now also at war um, and not just performing masculinity. And, and so it's, it was a very intense uh, uh, journey through that. Um, this is also from the body of work in and around home in 2005. And this is a blonde uh, news reporter and a brunette news reporter. If you had any question of their hair color. Um, <laughs> but they're kind of in between the news, but the news story behind them, and I really like representing news or the idea of making news. I'm fascinated by that. And, uh, but what they were reporting on is in the house behind them, there was a huge protest and it's 34 sex offenders living in one home in my neighborhood. And the neighbors felt like 34 sex of registered sex offenders were too much for one neighborhood. So, uh, so the news was re reporting on it. This is from a body of work titled Girlfriends. This is Jenny and it was taken in 2009. And after going for three uh, years photographing high school football, I started like really missing making portraits of my friends and I hadn't done it in quite some time. And I wanted to play around with kind of language and art and I was thinking about Richard Prince's girlfriends and kind of the relationship of that versus butch identity and what is sexy to me. So it's a little game of tic-tac-toe that I'm playing with Richard, so to speak. And uh, it was all iconic kind of known butch lesbians like Eileen Miles and Jenny Shimutsu and Katie Lang. And it was like a whole body of work around that along with black and white photographs uh, from my archive in relationship to more, more images that would look closer to Maplethorpe to a certain extent that I've never really brought out until recently. Because I always tried very hard to stay away from being necessarily in the same camp even though you end up in the same camp as everybody else. So I was really very conscious with moving the bodies of work through this inside and outside language of existence in relationship to the totality of what it is to be within society. These are surfers, two from the surfer series which I made with an 8x10 camera in 2003. They followed a body of work of ice houses from Minnesota. They are about temporary community. They're about waiting. They're about the pause. They're about meditating. They're about also the iconic images of surfers are always ripping it and that we never realize that a good portion of surfing is actually waiting in between the sets. And within that, those are the moments that you make connections with people in the water. You have conversations. And you realize that, you know, a major film producer like Brian Grazer's next to like, you know, the dude who's like the stoner who serves every day. And that that kind of relationship of temporal community versus how we build neighborhoods is so fascinating to me. And that's also what was existing in the ice houses for me that you could pull away the ice house if all of a sudden you had a disagreement with your neighbor. They didn't have to be your neighbor anymore. It's just like, yep, yeah, okay, I'm gonna move over to that pot of ice houses. Abstract landscapes were being made along with the portraits in black. They're all of national parks, but the, the abstraction happens within the racked focus. I was really, really playing and joking around, I guess, in my own head with the idea of what happens with Instagram, that now that people go to 
the Grand Canyon, they get out of their car, they take a picture of it, they post it, they get in their car and they drive away. And what is our relationship to these natural places? How do they serve us? How does even a photograph of nature serve us anymore? So by just racking the focus, I began to also play with what was happening with the popularity of abstraction in photography at that time. So these were starting to be made around 2009 and another one. And then this is from uh, the Mini Malls, which was uh, a, a body of work that I made directly after I made these little photographs of iconic empty freeways in LA. And the Mini Malls for me were another specificity of identity that in the Mini Mall is the story of immigrant communities of Los Angeles, that the facade in themselves tell a different story than the kind of master plan suburban communities of Noah's Bagels and Starbucks and Jamba Juices, that here you traverse the city of LA and through the facade of the mini mall, you know what kind of immigrant communities you've entered and exited. And so I did a body of work on mini malls and then I went out and I did an entire body of work of American cities. And when I was living in New York and teaching at Yale, I was doing a body of work called Wall Street. And this is the Trade Towers uh, literally two weeks before 9-11 happened. And it made me realize at that point and with high school football that, that maybe I didn't grow up to be a social documentary photographer, but maybe I decided to be a photographer in relationship to bearing witness. That maybe bearing witness is actually more interesting than thinking about a documentary practice, but also that I always thought of photography being really, really important 100 years from now, like when I go into the archives and I look at Moybridge prints or I look at things like that, and just the immediacy of what happened with 9-11 really changed the, the idea of what history is in relationship to making images. Because immediately the body of work of Wall Street changed. It no longer became about Wall Street and the specificity of identity in relationship to New York and thinking about Abbott and things. It became a memorial. This is Chicago. The specificity of identity of Chicago was how they light their architecture at night. And then with it, I did the four seasons of Lake Michigan. And I waited two years for Lake Michigan to freeze for winter. And the curators kept holding off the show because I'm like, no, I've got to get the ice. I've got to get the ice. And they're like, we can't hold off the show anymore. And so I didn't really get winter. Um, and then, of course, the following year, it froze up in that great way that you would want to see Lake Michigan. I went on a container ship in 2009 from the port of Busan in Korea to the port of Long Beach uh, with Hanjin Shipping and the body of work was, uh, was making sunrises and sunsets. So the relationship of the horizon line, of the changing of time, of the waiting, of being on a journey at the ship, but also that the biggest cliche you can do in photography is a sunrise and sunset. And then on days there were just solid fog. So there is a moment where it breaks and you have to question that kind of grappling. But the horizon line for me is a very important place and Helen Molesworth said it the best when I had the show at the ICA. A number of years ago, she curated a great show called Empty and Full at the ICA, and she wrote about my horizon lines being my marker of democracy, that I need for everything to be thought of as equal. And it was so great that she wrote about it that way because I hadn't really been thinking about it that way. They just had to be that way. And that's the beauty of a great curator is they'll give you insights uh, to your own work. This is Oliver with Mrs. Nibbles. These are photographs that were made on black. I saw two really important shows in London. Um, I saw the Da Vinci show as well as the Richter show at the Tate. And Richter for the first time had put the abstract paintings with the more formal portraits. And that's when I decided to use the abstract landscape as that device. And so I was really just thinking about, again, like how do I get people to slow down? What does an image mean to us now? How do I get people connected to it and, and the relationship to what it is to look? 
And so most of the body of work ended up being about my artist friends as well as my family. So this is Lawrence. Another abstract. We have David and Thelma. I use only first names because I want the, the relationship to celebrity to be taken out, that they're my friends. So it's about people that I've been, David and Lawrence and John Baldessari and all these wonderful people I've known since I was in my 20s. And there was something about making sure that in the same way that I documented my, my queer community that I began documenting my artist community. And the black space is about an internal space. It was also the time that I started going through menopause. So the very first beginnings of this body of work have a lot of reference to blood in them. And, uh, and I don't have any of those today. Uh, Ron Athey, so I was making um, ovals because I was thinking about oversized cameos. And I made a series of cameos as well. Uh, this is Rick and Michelle. and Betty. So now on to the not greatest hits, but the new grappling with what photography is for me. And I'm gonna take a sip of water here for this and lean on the, lean on the podium for this one. Okay. So in a oversaturated media world in which we have become, uh, what is, and you know, I have so, have had so many interviews and I, I'd be interested other people have, have, have this question constantly as like, well, you know, aren't there too many photographs? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I suppose, but it all depends on what you do with the image, you know? I mean, is there too much uh, boxes of cereal choices in the supermarket? I suppose so but what's, what's my relationship to it and what's the conversation? And I think the conversation needs to be ever evolving as our world evolves and that the form and the function of ideas of representation need to be as challenged as what the single photograph also does so beautifully and so perfectly. So this is me grappling with the relationship to the single image within these bodies of work. The Modernist is the first body of work I'll show you. And The Modernist was made in 2017 and it's in conversation with Chris Marker's La Jete, which is an experimental film of black and white stills that was made in 1962, where the fear then was nuclear war in relationship to what was happening throughout the world and, and so forth. The Modernist is about um, the protagonist, uh, Pigpen, who I have photographed for years in my work. And uh, Piggy acted in The Modernist. And this is about the relationship of the haves and have-nots. It was actually before Parasite. Uh, but a lot of it is like the fact that the protagonist starts destroying and burning down all the iconic modernist houses of Los Angeles. And they live in their one room, 500 square foot studio in LA and sleep on a couch because that's all they can afford. And then they make this big collage as their artwork from the newspaper clippings of, of the buildings that they burnt down. And so inside the theater, what you have is inside the gallery, I built a theater. The architect was Michael Maltzen. So you went into the theater to see the film. The film ran for 27 minutes and it has only one motion in it and that's one sound in the middle of the film. So within this piece you enter there. It was really important that the walls were reflective materials such as glass houses and the ideas of modernism as a utopic dream. And I'm really questioning, well, what is utopia for us now? Like in relationship to the world that we're living in, how do we hold on to that? How do we hold on to these ideas of peace and utopia and these other ideas that are so important to us to kind of continue to strive to a better humanity, but what, what are they doing and how are they serving us within the, our own city that we live in? That no longer are case study houses actually affordable, that they're actually iconic jewel pieces of architecture that sell for millions of dollars. 
So around it, the photographs in the exhibition were all done vertically because the film was horizontal and I wanted the differentiation between landscape and portraiture embedded within the body of work. And then this is the inside of the theater. And then this is a clip of, from the film. This is a very iconic house called the Sheets Goldstein House in LA. This is the uh, mural printed uh, in color. It was photographed one-to-one -one scale and then reproduced. So this is titled A Mural by Stosh. Um, Pigpen's name is Stosh. And so this is, this is just the image from, from the, uh, the film. In the film, um, the character goes back in and out of the studio from a dream state, from the making of the mural to the burning down of the houses. They go buy flowers one day at the grocery store. Um, but it's, it's a very quiet piece. And then I manipulated the LA Times to be the real L T LA Times during that day and the fake news. And this was also before Trump was elected. And the film was actually going to be longer and kind of be more perverse, but then what was happening in the country was so perverse at the time that I couldn't even go into the further perversion of what I wanted it to be. So with it, then these are just three of the stills that you would have seen around the gallery. So just using the idea of reflection, mirror, queer identity, trans identity. You see in the last mirror, the makings of the mural in the back. A lot of the film pauses on this for the longest moment. None of the, the images, as you can see, are timed the same. They all come across in different ways to create different sense of motion. And so the sleeping one, you often wondered if this was all just a dream, because that was something that Marker was playing with as well, as ideas of memory and dream. So these are just some of the individual photographs. Pigpen wanted a bigger gas can, got very upset after seeing the size of the gas can I purchased. So there is a bigger gas can in the next picture. I want you to take note to, uh, to apparently I wasn't butch enough with a gas can. Okay, see that? See the upgrade there? <laughs> Pig Ben was serious. Uh, also wanted me to fill it with water so that they would feel the weight of it because we end up splashing water around as if it's the gas of the set. And then I had to... I ended up trying to like Photoshop fires from, you know, borrowing images uh, from um, Getty Image and stuff, and they all sucked. So I started building all these fires in my backyard to photograph so that I, and it had fans on them so that they'd be blowing. So when you see the actual film, the fires aren't real, they're all Photoshop. No modernist houses were harmed in the making of this piece. <laughs> So the, yeah, you can see Piggy starting to just pour the water all over. This is, a, this is the Chemisphere house, which is a Lautner. Both of them are Lautners. And then on the precipice. 
I got really into the flames. I got really into the matches. It turns out that Pigpen and I both were a little bit pyro kids, like little baby butches who like to set fires. We never burned anything down, but apparently we did, you know, when we were building the fires together in the backyard, Pigpen and I were very excited about it. <laughs> As you can see, the kind of reflection within the glasses. I really wanted it to be black and white also because of La Jete. It was important that the color, because the gas can and the colors and what it would look like would have been very different. I always feel that black and white is this kind of democratic way of looking at an image. That color is so powerful. More fires. We built little models of the houses and then we burned those down as well. The artist thinking, the artist working. So in it, with this film, and when you see the kind of jerkiness of the language, it also becomes a little bit like slam poetry. So you end up having like, you know, LA area artists, stuff you've seen for years, eliminate Los Angeles. And then there's different moments within the collage that are really important to me. Like a little boy from Aleppo was found and that news image was everywhere and I cut him out and I put him in the middle of the Eames living room. So what is our relationship to, to housing, to everything? But I wanted it to be sexy too. <laughs> so... So in 2019, following that in 2017, I made Rhetorical Landscapes. Rhetorical Landscapes is in the full move of the Bush administration. I mean, I, I'm sorry, not the Bush administration, but the fucking Trump administration. <laughs> <laughs> Which fucking administration was it? No, sorry. <laughs> and I was thinking about collage and the power of collage. And I was also thinking about the fact that one day we're not going to have magazines to cut out that there, there won't be that, that ephemera, that materiality. What is our materiality and what is our relationship to the screen? And so these were bought on Amazon. I bought them because they looked the most like the first iteration of the iPhone. And every one is a stop motion collage. And each one of them deal with different subject matters such as immigration, uh, medicine, climate change, um, and, uh, you know, just kind of the top things of, of uh, white supremacy and so forth in them. And I'm going to show you a few of the collages. But again, in the same way that I talk about that abstract landscape as a pause, the idea of drain the swamp, the, the idea of the relationship of drain the swamp over and over again. And these are the most delicate, beautiful eco environments that are so important. And one day they will be underwater was just again like what is the rhetoric, so rhetorical, the notion of, of how do we begin to think about language and imbue that language in complicated ways that is both about beauty and about the politic of the moment. So I went throughout the south in Florida, Georgia, and Louisiana and I made swamp landscapes. This is what they looked like installed. And then this is each one of the landscapes. I really fell in love with the Okie Finokis. Plus, it's fun to say. It's kind of like Okie Dokie, Kathy Opie, you know? <laughs> but the quietness and the stillness, and these are also what I considered bad National Geographic photographs. Because they're not quite good enough to make it to Nat Geo, you know? Like, the depth of field's a little wrong. They're, they're just a little off in a way. You know, just like the depth in the woods and the relationship of what's happening in the print is really incredible. And this is the worst way to be seeing my work. It really is. It's like work that you want to stand before. Scale is everything. Installation is everything. Each space is considered heavily in relationship to the architecture of this space and how I want the work to be read and how I want it to function. I think I put myself in these spaces. I'm about ready to go off to Norway for a month in the deep winter because this is my pause as well. That this is the moment that I can 
journey that I can explore, that I can wander, that I can gather what's out in the world. And even though I go back and forth from the studio in the, you know, the kind of outside world, as we call it, and I'm not just world building, um, I find these moments so incredibly important for my psyche. And photography is about stillness as well. This one is really interesting because the reflection is ac actually more in focus and has this weird like moment in it than the, uh, the actual landscape. And this isn't snow, it's a bog. First I thought I would have like go in the night and I was like, I get to Florida and I'm like, yeah, well I wanna do night photographs of the swamps. And they're like, yeah, you, you can't do that. <laughs> and I'm like, well, why not? And I was like, well, you know, there are really large alligators everywhere. <laughs> and I was like, Okay. <laughs> so this is an animation. Each of the animations are about two to three minutes long. The backgrounds are hand painted by me and I'll explain that a little bit later. I'll just let you watch quietly. It's all stop motion animation. And then it freezes on the screen for 30 minutes as an image and then the next collage would start after that. Um, I wanted to use the hand painted grid because I wanted to reference the kind of Bauhaus movement in relationship to political art and what the grid is. But it was really important that returning these to these kind of oversized iPhone monitors that everything was still about the hand within it. So the idea of stop motion animation which I grew up with Monty Python and being aware of Terry Gillum. Here's, here's another one. I guess it started on its own. But you'll see that each background is painted differently. It says don't shoot on the hands. And then a teeny tiny Colin Kaepernick comes in. The newsboy keeps announcing the news of the day. So with my assistant, I would, uh, I would build out, I, I had an animator work with me on this body of work that just graduated from CalArts. 
And um, I would build out the entire narrative as a collage and then I would break it down and then I would narrate with my voice the movement that I wanted. And I wanted there to be weird humor like a bouncing baseball and you know, a rug going under the fist and then the soccer team coming in because you know, one of the things that I think that is really interesting right now is the relationship to comedy and, and, and our, our position within trying to be a kinder society and what happens to satire and what happens to these different ways of dealing with very, very tough information um, in relationship to the world that we're living in. This is the last one I'm gonna show you, which is all uh, climate change in terms of the rising water. I bought a cross-section of magazines for about two and a half years. I, I think that the NRA really wants me, uh, F for that gun piece. I mean, uh, I get every invitation to every Trump event you can imagine because of this cross-section of American magazines that I did. But it was about 32 magazine subscriptions for about two and a half years that I spent ripping and cutting and the images out of and then finally making the collages. The sign says there is no threat that comes up before the little baby seal. Okay, so the next body of work, um, so that, that, that ended up being out there all on its own because it opened in LA uh, with Lawrence Wiener and then the pandemic hit uh, the week, week and a half after it opened and so that was it. That was, the show was up in LA for a week and a half and then it just has lived, you know, out there as the, this thing I made that nobody saw. But now you've seen some of it. <laughs> 2020, wow, a lot to say about 2020. As a year, it was the year my son graduated high school but didn't get to walk, which is not as big a deal of what was happening in the world. That's nothing compared to uh, the social unrest, the injustice, the continuation of everything. And so just like in 1999 and in and around home, I, this is the body of work I made with my Guggenheim Fellowship. So I got a sabbatical year and it was so great. Like how well planned was that to gr do a sabbatical during the pandemic? Um, which is also not really well planned because like I didn't feel like then I was gonna get the work done. So I announced to my wife that I was buying an RV, uh, that I bought an RV. Not that I was buying an RV. I was like, hey, I bought an RV today. <laughs> She's like, what? I'm like, yeah, I bought an RV. This way we can get Oliver to college and I can go off and make work. Isn't that a great idea? Do you want to come? <laughs> so we spent, I spent a month and a half on the road making this body of work after I drove Oliver to Tulane University in Louisiana where they had school in person because they're Louisiana. <laughs> and, uh, and the body of work was exploring the idea of monuments and the relationship to them in terms of the American landscape. So the first piece that I made is a poem to it before I started editing the diptychs. And the poem is lowercase letters and it's monument slash monumental. And it begins to talk about the relationship of whose land is this anyway? What is our relationship to histories of, of injustice? Uh, the only photograph that's in focus is the Robert E. Lee from Richmond, Virginia in the middle, which became an activist site and so in the, the important thing about this as a stanchion or as a poem is in the very beginning, do I have the laser? No, oh, do I? Do you see it on the screen? Yeah. Oh, I see it now. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Let's try that again. Okay, there we go. So you'll see in the first image, it's a sunset. And the bookend image is also a sunset. But the relationship to the sunset metaphorically is the most important aspect of, of the poem in which that the sun never sets. 
that the camera position has been changed, but the sun is in the exact same position in the sky, that only the camera has been changed. So you, leaning really heavy on the idea of language and metaphor in this piece was incredibly important to me. So these are the single images from Monument Monumental. The idea of a divided nation. Water as the connector, the rebirth, the thing that's gonna become most precious for us all as we continue. The idea of reflection. Then with it are a series of diptychs, and it was one of these challenges again that I had gone out and I made this body of work, and I had normally done documentary work in relationship to single images, and I couldn't get it down to a single image. There isn't a single image that can describe the time that we're living in. So I decided the most interesting thing about what I do and what my practice is, is about the conversations that I make the relationship to dialogue, the constant outreach of humanity, the, the relationship of the complication of images and metaphor and how language is developed through the image. So I decided that these diptychs begin to talk to each other. So the uh, protest from LA that I was at were Black, uh, for Black Lives Matter and then the beginning of the map of my traverse through the South for making the landscapes. The idea of exposed roots what that means metaphorically to everybody in the water in the middle of a pandemic in the Ozarks in the middle of August. To the areas throughout the South that just shrouded their monuments, to the memorials placed around of each person killed by police officers around the Richmond, Virginia site as an activist. So the idea of death and shrouded, that the shrouding it is not going to do anything. The idea from uh, the Stonewall Jackson Monument to then this woman in Georgia brought out her phone to show me where the monument once was on that grass that had been removed for her cigarette break. So the idea just formally of how that ends up on the plinth. The ideas of social media in relationship to our lives and that we all make screenshots as well as photographs from the TV. And so this screenshot I made on my phone to really follow what was happening in Richmond along with then the debate of the fly. The fly is the thing that got talked about the most, not the substance, but the fucking fly. What are we all doing, you guys? <laughs> to Brianna Taylor's memorial to a young family in Richmond who asked me to take their photograph and just the relationship of the mother to the relationship to Brianna, the idea of the colors and the flowers and, the, and what happens physically with those two pieces in juxtaposition and in conversation with one another to the extent the way that we think about the single image. To George Floyd's eye in Portland, Oregon to an impoverished community through the South poverty kills, to pandemic moments where people serve you weird little goldfish crackers in a medical glove at a cocktail party <laughs> because shit like that happened, <laughs> to the idea of, of the ocean and the, whoops, uh, see they warned me against that. Uh, the ocean and the divide with then a trailer uh, mobile home in Texas to the memorial site where the lynching, to this uh, monument uh, still existing, a Confederate monument in New Orleans that uh, has spray paint on it commissioned by Klansmen, to the kudzu that grows everywhere in the South that's as pervasive as racism, to Duke University removing their Confederate monument in the chapel, and instead in front is a young African-American woman with her daughter graduating 
to horrible things that happen in RVs like watching the Republican National Convention on your iPad because you have to be informed at all times because I'm a crazy, crazy person who watches and reads too much. To them, the Daughters of the Confederacy, to their, to their um, headquarters, to high schools named after Robert E. Lee, that they don't know what to do with that history in the Black South. To Abraham Lincoln's boyhood home and the monument that outside of the museum in relationship to emancipation and slavery to then still the existence of these monuments in Richmond, Virginia. To the setting sun again and the road trip because every photographer has to make the middle of the road trip photograph when you're driving miles around the country. To a very bizarrely well cared Confederate monument beside somebody's house to a white suburban country club that has been bashed out and have uh, horrible things written about uh, black people inside the walls of this country club, to then the front porch with the cross and the picket fence, to the swamp that people cross through, to freedom, to yet another monument. And then the body of work ends on optimism in relationship to the cobwebs that were caught in and the true monuments and ascension that we do. And there's like little teeny hikers ascending that. And in In and Around Home, there's a moment where it's an LAPD helicopter with a rainbow kite, because I always believe in some kind of sense of hope in this world that we're living in. Walls, windows, and blood, another critique of mine, a spatial critique. I was invited uh, to the American Academy for residency, uh, which is a six-week residency that I did uh, uh, two years ago. And uh, I was there, I guess, uh, May and June and part of, yeah, May and June. And so the, the, the theme of the residency was a city within a city, and I decided to photograph the Vatican because of it being, uh, all the bodies of work I did on American cities. But as I made the body of work over six weeks, I came up with my own trilogy um, for my Holy Trinity, which was walls, windows, and blood to begin to use the architecture of the Catholic Church and the Vatican itself in relationship to a critique of the incredible acts of inhumanity that has happened um, as a result of the ideology of the Catholic Church. A lot of people ask me if I was raised Catholic. No, in 1961, my dad in Sandusky, Ohio, chose to raise me as an atheist which is very unusual. So these are installation shots from a show I just opened two weeks ago in Naples, Italy. The first place that the work went was Naples. And so I wanted to play with the columns of the gallery as these kind of also positioned places that the walls are leaned in between the columns with these marble plinths so that the walls don't have the right to hang anymore. They're shot with a Hasselblad X-Pan, so they're 35 millimeter film, and the grain of these are just so yummy, that, and they're over six feet tall. And so there are the, uh, the uh, points around the Vatican Museum of the walls where the walls are uh, coming in and coming out, and there's uh, seven points that I chose to document of this. The walls are also not only architectural moments throughout the space of the gallery, but they also, you'll see within the images, they all have cameras. So they are itself their own apparatus. Um, this is titled No Apology. This is the very day in Rome, in the square, that the Pope in the window there came and uh, did not apologize for the uh, children that were just discovered in Canada, the indigenous uh, children that were sent to boarding school with horrible atrocities to them. Across from this in this space is then a blood grid. So I photographed every single window in the Vatican looking out of the museum. I photographed every representation of the blood within the artwork of the Vatican, and then I created my own taxonomy of that. And then all of it was installed in Italy during one of the high holy days of the Catholic Church called San Gennaro. And so it was really important that it was framed within that. And the ironic thing with it is the head priest from the Vatican came to the opening he fell in love with the work. He wants to write about it for the Vatican News. 
And also, as you know, and if you're news readers, you understand that you know, the Pope is having quite a struggle with the idea of, of the hypocrisies of the Catholic Church. So it's really interesting timing. Timing is everything in life. And so this is just some installation shots where the gallery becomes its own outside space through the windows. And the windows are a further kind of meaning of the idea of transparency for me, but they're also just the simplest way to begin to document uh, these spaces. And what it means to look out onto both the interior of the Vatican and the exterior into Rome. This is an example of a blood grid over one of the fireplaces. The place was an old consulate, so it, it has like a lot of domestic touches to it. This is, uh, you'll see myself in, the, in it. This is the, the kind of self-portrait that I do a lot of reflections and bodies of work of myself where I'm, you can find the author, so to speak. Where's Waldo moment? So let's, uh, enough installation shots. It's a very beautiful space. Um, uh, it was amazing to see how many people traveled all over the world to see this because I said that this was the installation that was most important to me because of the structure of the gallery, that I could use the architecture in a way with the body of work that I wouldn't be able to replicate in other galleries. So here is some of the walls. You see the cameras up on top. And I also, I'm a lover of banality in photography, right? Like new topographics drive me crazy as, as, a, as a moment within photography. And I remember like I used to lecture a lot on American cities and people would be like, I really like your color work, but you know, the black and white work is kind of boring. So I realize that some of this might be a little bit boring, but I'm just gonna show it to you anyway. <laughs> it's better in person though, it really is. It's the detail of things. It's just like architecture and skin for me are the same places. That the body is a site of architecture. That it is a place of identity. That it carries things. It carries history within itself. What are these histories? How do we think about them? What is the specificity of identity? Why can't we reach a greater humanity in this world? I think that my work is about trying to answer my own questions. And they're about trying to frame the time that I'm living in through something that can be, you know, experienced on a formal level, but also on a much deeper metaphorical level in relationship to how a photograph operates. Like shadows, you know, that like that shadow at that time happened. Like it matters to me. And I know we want to get to questions, so I'm going to go through things fast now, okay? Uh, the marble plinths were designed by the architect Kati Barkin. They were made in Naples at a foundry. Then here are the windows. The windows are just so fantastic because they have scrims and screens and holes. They hold this history of looking out. But more importantly, nobody goes into the Vatican Museum thinking about the windows that they're looking out, <laughs> they're looking at the art. And so to also frame it from this inside outside, this idea of like what is embodying this ideologically. Windows you can't see through. With scrims and air conditions and moments. And then my favorite part in the body of work is the fact that Rome itself reflects all of it in the moment of the window in, inside the Vatican. So there is a moment when those two different cities join together. It was shocking to me that I didn't get stopped after six weeks. I went four times a day, about six hours a day, with three cameras. 
And like never once was I asked, why do you, and it's during the pandemic, so I wasn't, it wasn't like there weren't any really, there was very few visitors in the Vatican, so I could, I could lay down in the Sistine Chapel on the, my back in the middle of the floor and be alone there for 30 minutes and nobody would come through. And so the other thing is it's so interesting when work is made and the timing of work and that photography works so specifically with this in this way that it's a time-based medium because in the same way that like when I was photographing Elizabeth Taylor's home and then she died in the middle of it and then it became this different body of work or 9-11 or the fact that it's a pandemic and I can wander through without hardly any people in the Vatican is really amazing because this work actually, I went back last summer to the Vatican to photograph some blood that I didn't feel came out very well. So I went back to remake the images and I could barely make them. I could barely find room to make them. So the quietness also of the window is the window in relationship to the pandemic beside just also the ideology of transparency. They're very formal, as most of my work is formal, as you've noted. I can't help myself. I keep trying to be messy. I'm just not messy. The blood grids. So the blood grids are their own taxonomy. I'm thinking about the relationship of retelling the story, that this, this story is told through the halls of the Vatican year after year after year and how the specificity of how you're led through it, the tapestry room and everything. And I'm really offended that there's trigger warnings that are placed by institutions on my work and on my self portraits, but you can wander through the Vatican and there's no trigger warnings. Doesn't make any sense to me. And so these blood grids begin to operate as their own kind of relationship to the order of the story of Christ and Christianity and the horrific natures of mankind. One of the things I love about the blood grids is when you get really into them with the different artists, that the blood is the moment that they had fun. The blood was the moment that there was freedom within the work because all of a sudden they got to be an abstract painter for a little bit of time. This is the only one that has a direct relationship to a tapestry where the sword is going into the baby's head. And that's the only one that is actually somewhat narrated from the actual work within the Vatican. And that's all I have for you. Thank you so much for coming. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions at all. We have microphones on either side of the room, so please raise your hand high, and we will come to you. Hi there. Um, Hi there. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, I had a question about, like, the subjects in your photographs, like some of your older work, um, who weren't family and friends, did you establish any kind of relationship with them? I'm thinking like specifically of like the surfers or the like football players. No, I, I didn't actually. I mean, the, they were taken in very moments. Like the surfer uh, portraits were made right after they came out of the ocean from surfing because I wanted that kind of endorphin look within their bodies. And I also really wanted to make, again, not the iconic surfer magazine surfer, but like who was out on the beach surfing and make a range of work. 
And so there were people that reached out to me afterwards when they, they saw it. And this is always the heartbreaking moment in my life is both with surfers as well as with my portraits I made of friends. You know, uh, one of the surfers that I photographed died of a drug overdose, so the family mm -hmm. used his portrait because he felt that it was the happiest moment ever of his life of what I captured. And same with football players, as I've had parents write me saying that they lost their son in Afghanistan and that my portrait of them was one of the most amazing gifts that they had. But those were very brief moments. They were on the field. There was always a line of football players because it was always done after practice, not after games, because no way are you going to get a bunch of young men to, you know, stand for you after a game. They want to go out and party. And so it was always done after practice. And I also wanted that after practice look. It was something different. But um, no, I mean, my, it started, the, the, the football portrait started with my nephew, though. It started with me having to go to Louisiana every summer to Church Point in August and being there for about three weeks with my wife's family in a small, teeny Cajun town and uh, being the biggest dyke in the town <laughs> that could be there and feeling very awkward in the middle of this bit large Catholic family. And I had 25 nieces and nephews. And um, I said had because we just got divorced, but they don't talk to me anymore <laughs> anyway. That's why I said had. They're all living, fortunately. But uh, anyway, that's a lot of explaining. Never mind. Go on. Next question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but high school football did start with my nephew and having to go to Louisiana. Uh, hi. Sorry. I was wondering about your uh, pieces depicting your queer community if you've ever thought or why you haven't wanted to um, take photos of them now as they've gotten older and like document the aging in the queer community and the beauty in that? Well, a lot of my friends do keep showing up in my work. So when you see the first photographs of pig pen, there's only like a little, an arm tattoo and like pumpkins on the knees and then the accumulation of the body of both Idexa and Piggy, you know, have gone on. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I really feel like different bodies of work are important because of the moment, and I very rarely do like, okay, let's go back in time kind of thing, but my relationships with people carry on and they often still end up in the work. Got one back in the back, orange hat back there. Hey there, <laughs> now I've embarrassed you. Um. First, I'd like to say you're awesome. And I was wondering, in general, how many images consist of each body of work that you have? Oh, boy, yeah. Well, digital has really, like, messed me up, right? Because film, when I shoot an 8x10 film or 4x5, it's what I could afford. And when I was doing the early portraits, I could only afford 10 sheets of film per person. Um, so now I photograph too much, which makes editing really, really much harder. But the richness of the idea of being able to shoot that much just because you, you can, I guess I shouldn't be using the word shoot anymore, but it's, I'm an old school photographer, making photographs. <laughs> In making photographs, the abundance is kind of interesting to me now. So with the Elizabeth Taylor work, it was three days a week for six months that I went to the house and carefully documented. And then to pare that down to the book and the portfolio was really impossible. But you just get into the groove of editing. You just like, you edit the same way. And I, ed I don't edit on the computer screen. Even though I photograph digitally, I make big, huge binders of every body of work, and they're all contact sheets. And I edit through the binders and marking the pages, and I have a whole system of editing in that way. And then they get to be prints, and then I edit through the prints, and then I scale up the prints, and then I edit through that. And then by the end of it, I have figured out hopefully a body of work. One more here. We have a question right down here. I was just wondering, um, how do you approach navigating the American landscape while queer, especially in areas where it's less safe to exist in? It's, it was hard early on. It was hard. I mean, I, I was scared at moments. Even when I was photographing for the New York, um, the New York Times Magazine in the early 90s, I was asked to 
photograph this one kid from this like very intense religious right family and I think that the New York Times chose me because they were, were hoping for like kind of a arbist portrait but I'm not that kind of photographer and I never have been. Everybody needs to be dealt with in a really good human way in my mind. But you know that was I took out all my piercings. Um, I would I would wear different clothing at times depending on where I was. Um, I would often feel in certain coffee shops by myself that I wasn't necessarily welcomed and I read very much as like a big old leather dyke. And, um, and that was hard, but then the other thing about going out and getting away from your community and wandering is you understand how you find safe space too. And you understand the relationship of what that safe space means for everybody else throughout the country who aren't necessarily coming out in San Francisco of all places. And so the ability to navigate that is also so important in relationship to knowing the extent of, of, of the desire of setting up community and the relationship to community. And so there's both things. There's like, oh God, here I go again. And then the other part of it is like, oh my God, look at what I discovered. All right, we'll take our last question up front here. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that you mentioned was this kind of wondering what utopia looks like for yeah. us now. Um, and I was wondering if you would say that you are looking for utopia in mm. your work and like how would that function in your photography? Well, I think I searched for utopia with self-portrait cutting on my back in 1993 and that's what that was about. And I got to have a beautiful 21 year marriage and a family and a child and something that I had desired and carved on my own body. And I don't know if I think I'm, I'm looking for utopia anymore. Um, I think that I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to be useful in this world and what the relationship of being useful is. And I'm thinking a lot about what I want to do with the rest of the time that I have in being an artist and the fact that I am now retired from academia and I won't have that kind of mentorship that I'm doing on a regular basis. And I think that I'm gonna start volunteering in kindergartens and first grades, and I think I'm gonna go back to like early childhood education that I wanted to come out of, and I'm gonna work on literacy for you know, communities in LA that need that for kids going to college and things like that. And so I think in between making the work that I'm still going to try to reach out and, and my utopia is actually in relationship to trying to continue to make a kinder place for people and a better place. Yeah, I know that's a really hokey, hippie answer, and that might sound really California, <laughs> but that's what I have for you. <laughs> thank, thank you all for coming out. <laughs>